Hello to the chicas and the chicas. How are you going? Lovely folks. Today I'm going to put on my Mythbuster mustache or the cool hat that you can see in the thumbnails so that uh, I will be uh, looking like those dudes because we are uh, en route now to bust a myth. And um, this is something that I wanted to talk about uh, earlier on. I, I have been wanting to discuss this because uh, I think it's very important that we actually clarify a couple of things about openings in general. So when um, beginners, uh, club level players, um, adult improvers start developing their opening repertoire, and but by the way, I get a lot of comments about the way how I say repertoire, which is a French word, so I'm very curious why. Anyway, so please comment below about how I'm supposed to say it as opposed to the way I am, whatever. So they develop a repertoire and then generally speaking the first question is are you a positional player or are you a tactician because if you are positional then d4 and if you are a tactical then e4. And anytime I hear it the only reaction I have is to remove my glasses so that I can just give myself a solid face palm for hearing that nonsense. It's utter nonsense. There is no such thing as e4 being tactical and d4 being positional. It's just pfft, downright wrong. Um, what the, the main divider between these two, because there is a very firm characteristic difference between these two, that is correct. But it's not tactical versus positional. It's actually open, semi-open versus closed. And that's it. And so there is no point in you being a tactician going like, oof, no d4, thank you, I love attacking, and vice versa, you can't go like, well, I, I prefer a positional maneuvery type of play, so no e4, thank you, it does not make any sense at all. You cannot choose between e4 and d4 based on your style, because, because both moves, Loa, speaking is hard, both moves allow you to choose openings within e4 or d4 that will allow you to be either tactical or positional. So once again, the main characteristic difference between e4 and d4 is that d4 openings traditionally tend to be a lot more closed in structure. What it also means is that usually d4 openings are less confrontational in the very early phase of the game. If you think about it, there are far fewer gambit openings for white uh, that I can play as white in d4, uh, especially normal ones that don't lose in 10 moves, than as white. If you think about white, I can play the king's gambit, I can play the against e4, e5, I can play various Viennas, I can play the danish gambit, the scotch gambit against e4, c5, I can play the Mora, the Wing Gambit. Like there is a gazillion gambits there. For black, uh, sorry, for one d4, it's a lot more limited. That's not to say that you can't play gambits, by the way, in d4 openings. But again, typically, even the gambit variations tend to occur later on. And uh, more or less, d4 is the type of opening that, as I said before, allows you to do confrontation. Uh, in a delayed pace, so it's far more common in d4 openings that um, you know you, you you develop your castle and then we have a fight. Whereas in many e4 openings, they you can't really separate these. That they, there is a gray area where we haven't already where you haven't even finished development, but it's already a full-on battle. Um, and so d4 is a little bit slower paced at occasion and it's more closed these are the two main characteristics that separate e4 from d4 but if you think about the classical world champions and their styles so lasker was predominantly positional capablanca was predominantly positional yet they both played a lot of e4 right um smyslov was very very hardcore positional yet played quite a bit of e4 played d4 too don't get me wrong, but he did do e4 as well. Kasparov, the most vicious attacker, played a lot of d4 throughout his entire career. In fact, towards the end of his career, he said that after a long, long time of testing e4 and d4, he has found that d4 actually offers richer play and better chances to play for a win. So Tal, the most vicious attacker among all the world champions, 
did score one of his greatest victories in d4. He was a predominantly e4 player. But think about a few of his games. Tal Hecht. Uh, Van Olympiad, if I'm not mistaken, where he sacked a, a queen in that Nimzo. Tal Keller in that Slav. Oh my god. Uh, like I, and the list goes on. Karpov. Probably the greatest positional player of all times ever. Solidly switching to and fro between e4 and d4. So I, I have got a lot of students who have got a d4 repertoire, which is more actually directed towards an aggressive uh, attacking play style, much more so than a quiet positional one. Now, admittedly, there is no point in arguing that there are far more openings within d4 than in e4 that allow you to play positionally but I, i'm most and foremost first and foremost i would like to bust the myth that d4 is just purely positional like i could build you a repertoire around d4 that would be the most aggressive thing you have seen in your life let me show you a couple of examples the other day i played this blitz game i'm white yeah i have been playing d4 e4 pretty much 50 50 percent uh, for the past five, six years online, partly because I want to practice my D4 openings that I'm teaching to my students, so I, I feel like I'm keeping up with uh, what's going on, but also because I like to mix things up. And then my opponent plays uh, this weird, actually it's not weird at all, this would uh, be going into the Nordboom system if I play D3, and then I'm like, stuff this, Gambitos. And here we go, we have got a Gambit in our hands, right? I sack the pawn, I'm not going to get it back, ever, forget about it, that c4 is sealed, and so now I have to play with the better uh, center and the better development. That's like Morphe, who would never in his life touch the d-pawn uh, on first move, right? So these things can easily um, transfer uh, from one to the other, so now we are looking at a, an extremely vicious and very aggressive d4, I mean look at this, do, do you call this positional chess what white is doing here? Like mate threat on move nine. Hello? And by the way, this is this is not crazy chess. Like this is actually a sound move because the idea is that, uh, oopsies, that we want to provoke a weakness like g6 or something like that. And then the knight will read out to e4 and attack the d and f, uh, d6, f6 weak square. So this is not some gunk hole random attack. I play bishop e2, g6. And at this point in the game, uh, I, re well, I was tossing up between queen g4, queen h4 with the idea of defending the pawn or dropping that back to h3 which is the most optimal square for the queen because it maintains the attack here as well as here but admittedly it sacrifices a second, potentially a third pawn. Now all I needed to see and I don't want to brag here was that after queen d4 I have bishop e3 with the tempo and then after queen d5 I have got castles and I'm fully done with development. Check out my course development. This game would be a beautiful example there. Um, and my opponent has a queen and a bishop out. Is it worth three pawns? Definitely. Um, and so this is exactly what went down. Awesome, I'm recording. Um, proud of you, by the way. Um, now the whole world knows that you burped. Um, so, queen takes d4, bishop e3, queen takes e5, and call me crazy, but this does not look the slightest bit like a positional opening. It was d4, and it was just mental from beginning to end, and check out the end. I castled. Uh, that was actually a, a deep idea, because at first I wanted to play rook d1 with the idea of bishop d4, skewering these two and I noticed that if I castle then after bishop d4 this hangs with a check but as soon as I said that back in the day when I played this game until three days ago I realized that castles actually creates a beautiful threat pause the video if you want to work it out and that is is that after bishop g7 I have rook d8 check oopsie daisy and if king takes d8 I get a queen he plays king e7 rook d1 now all I need to do is to decoy the queen and then I have got uh, some kind of a checkmate uh, sooner or later, especially after knight f6, so I played f4 and now if the queen goes here I just take take and that checkmate is nothing to sneeze at. So he sacks the queen for a rook, I go in, I take the rook, I go in check and here I miss a beautiful mate 
Oh man, I can't believe I missed it. Like this game would have been one of the best attacking games of my life in D4 if I had seen that after check takes check, I had this absolutely breathtaking mate. Unfortunately, I messed this up here and I started giving checks like this and then my opponent messed up too because uh, he went back to C7 allowing this mate and the game came to a bit of an abrupt and uh, sort of weird end. C5 would have been nice, although even after that, Queen D8 check, King A7, Queen A5 creates Knight takes B5 mate threat, which is essentially unstoppable because Bishop C6 still allows Knight B5, Bishop takes and Queen mate. Now, this doesn't exactly look like a positional opening, does it? And it's not the only example by any means. Like, I'm going to show you right now, not quite a full repertoire, but just a, a, a little bit of it that how I could easily show you that I can build an extremely aggressive repertoire entirely around D4. So what you saw is perfectly valid against the Slav as well. So you can play Geller Gambit. Not that you need to because mainline Slavs can be very attacking too. Topalov played some very nice games. Against the Queen's Gambit declined, you could easily play uh, the Bishop F4 line, which is super aggressive, especially if you consider the main, main, main lines. I played one of these against Eric Rosen in one of our collabs. Opposite castle, King's Castles, G4, G5 incoming. Absolute mayhem. Absolute mayhem. Kasparov used to play this too. Very successful, needless to say, as well. Against the Indians, I mean, against the Nimzo, you can actually go and play a Queen's Indian defense. And now the extremely popular 21st century Gambit. Boy, this is mental. Again, in this opening, I have got a fair few games in my course. It's just bonkers. Like, this is one of the most awesome um, Gambit stars out there at the moment. Really, really cool stuff. Um, against the King's Indian, if you are really like Ro, uh, and you insist on all-out attacks, F4, four-point attack. Absolutely uncompromising, full-on attack. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, and in stark contrast, just so that we learn a little bit about uh, big dudes, um, here is one of my favorite games by Karpov, the greatest positional player of all time, E4. He played E4 against Kasparov in the World Championship final match. The greatest positional player of all time. Consistently E4. Um, I mean, in one of their matches. And he just takes on c6, and this is precisely what I'm talking about. The Rui Lopez, by definition, is an extremely positional opening, but the exchange in particular... I'm going to fly through the, the beginning because in a typical Karpov style, he just plays moves without doing too much until he gets this on the board. Now, positions don't get more positional than this. White has got a knight versus bishop. But uh, this set of pawns are really, really weak. And Karpov sets about to exploit that in a beautiful and typical Karpov fashion. By the way, this game um, I first saw in this book, which I shall review later on. Uh, Endgame Virtuoso Anatoly Karpov by fellow Hungarian. I already mentioned his name multiple times. Tibor Karoy, who is probably one of the best authors out there in the world, that is. Um... And so Karpov casually starts trading pieces. He's aiming for uh, an endgame scenario with fewer pieces so that Black's e-file dominance is less apparent. And then he trades, trades, and then he doesn't. Very cool move to deny the Black Rook penetrating the second rank. And then, wow, look at that. And now he wants to trade Queens when he has denied the Rook coming to e2. Trades Queens. And here comes one of my favorite things. You won't believe it. But at this point, Karpov already knows that he's going to trap the rook. And you heard me right. Check this out. H4. Knight back. I mean, this guy is just insane. Why is he going back here? Because he wants to play pawn c4. So pawn c4 is going to take away these two squares from the rook. That's Im amazing vision by Karpov. So th this is what Karpov does and used to do like nobody else in the world. He looks at this position and he goes like, my knight on c4 is doing nothing. I want it on d3, where it covers these two squares. Pawn c4 will cover these two. And you're already seeing how badly the rook on the fifth 
He's running out of air. Watch this. Rook f5 drops back, pretending that he's defending, but not really. H5 takes another square away from the rook. Karpov celebrates. Knight d3, rook e check, rook e3. Now the king is ready to go up. Just some positional maneuvering. G5, c4. And look how badly this rook is really, really getting caught there. C5, terrible mistake. But for the record, this rook is, has nowhere to go. So from here on, White's plan is to move the rook and just move up the king here. Extremely difficult to defend. And yes, the rook can swing across here, but after pawn a4, it virtually ran out of squares. And White would be a rook up. Now c5 obviously helped a lot. And now look at this rook. Take, take, and no squares left for the rook. Hello? Can move. And never will for the rest of the game. Rook e4, bishop back, f4, and um, Clovance resigns because king f3 is inevitable. Like, according to the engine, the best move for black here is rook d5. That paints a very, very sad pick. It's just insane. And Karpov regularly played e4 in order to get into endgames like this and skin his opponents alive. Let me show you one last thing about d4, just so that we are clear on this. For ex the, the point of, of the, or not the point, but one very cool d4 thing that e4 has on fewer occasions is that against almost any opening as a d4 player, you can choose a positional path or you can choose a very aggressive path. And it's entirely up to you which way you go. For example, against the very famous Grimfeld defense, Kram, uh, Kramnik made a living out of playing this uh, bishop e3, c5, oh, rook c1 maybe? I, I may be wrong on the move order here. This endgame variation. He played it a quadrazillion time with very, very good results. It's a very tiny edge for white, very tiny edge for white, but uh, something that you can squeeze for a very long time. That is the most positional play you can possibly play against the Grimfeld. I would even say that it's even more positional than the Fianchetto setups. Now, in stark contrast to that, check out my favorite variation against the Grimfeld, the Rook B1 line, which was extremely popular in the 90s, mostly by Gelfand, uh, it was played and some other top GMs. It's a very, very clever uh, idea where White actually sacrifices the a2 pawn by virtue of playing rook b1 and denying the development of the bishop. But after cd, cd check, a2 is capturable. And now it becomes an absolute mayhem and chaos again. This is, uh, was one of the most complicated theoretical lines in chess history. Like many, many games went up to move 30, 35 and still in theory. Um, castles, bishop g4, rook b7, all theory. Takes, takes, takes. All of this is theory. And I don't even want to go into it. I just want to show you the extreme contrast. Rook d8, queen c1, knight d7, bishop takes. This is all still, I believe, theory. Queen d1, knight c5. And here, uh, Machia went with the sack and if you go wrong here just one move you are dead and i don't think i need to be an international master to, conf uh, to confidently say that you guys can see it very easily that these dark squares are chronically weak around the black king e5 rook b8 that's the game losing blunder on move 20 100 certain that this is still theory after rook c7 which he failed to find Rook b8, bishop d5. Whoops, whoops, that king. I mean, look at how lonely that dude is. Queen a6, another blunder. And after e6, thank you very much. You can put the pieces back in the box. The game is over. They took queen f6 and that's the point. Pin, checkmate. They played rook c6, trying to sack the material back. But after takes, takes bishop a3 with the intended bishop b2 means that black can't avoid mate without sacrificing a ton of material. And I haven't even spoken about variations that are probably the craziest lines in chess history ever, such as the Meran, like mainline Meran, 
which was actually a topic of the Kramnik Anand match, which again is like theory until forever. Like this, this is one of my favorite variations actually um, as black. And uh, in this position, black often castles here and uh, it's just insanely complicated stuff. Absolutely mental. Um, and of course, there is also the Botvinnik. So if you don't want to play Meran as what, you can play Botvinnik. Thank you very much. Which well and truly is one of the most complicated openings. And again, I will more than challenge you to say that do you really, are you really serious that this has the look of a positional opening? I mean, who are we kidding here? After B4, one of the greatest lines is uh, rook b1 with the idea that if they take we take back then we take b7 then we take this with a discover check you see where this is going right this is not a positional opening thank you very much not even close to that and uh, there is a famous line here with uh 95 as well where white actually ooh, what have i done where white regularly um, uh, sacks a, a queen. I don't know what I did there, but uh, trust me, it was some cool stuff. So, yeah, um, long story short, you can't really pick between e4 and d4, in my opinion, whether you are a positional player or an aggressor, because d4 can easily offer you both, and so can e4. So... It's more of a preference, really, in my opinion, as to whether you enjoy playing a little bit more close positions with a somewhat uh, delayed conflict most of the times, or whether you want a, an instant bang-on fight from move 5, 6, 7. Also, I think from a white player perspective, almost inevitably, it comes down to, are you enjoying playing against the Sicilians? Because if you are an E4 player, at least... 40% of your games will be Sicilians. And if you like playing against the Sicilians, then maybe D4 is not necessarily the best choice for you, or only as a secondary. If you, on the other hand, like, as I said, more those close positions, and you like if uh, the fight starts a little bit later, uh, and you get to build your position at least a little bit, perhaps D4 is your way. But uh, once and for the last time, I'm telling you, you cannot distinguish between e4 and d4 as tactical versus positional. That's just nonsense. And on that note, folks, thank you very much for tuning in for this one. I will be back with more soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.